I say 540, auditing, accounting estimates and related disclosures. Guys, why have estimates been specifically highlighted by the auditing standards as needing additional work compared to any other balance? And the reason is because of the increased inherent risk of material misstatement because where there's an estimate there is uncertainty there's no cut and dry if risk requirement this is how you determine the balance if risk allows for judgment subjectivity in determining the balance and often there could be complexity in determining that balance the calculation Think about a type of inventory that may be complex to determine its value. Obviously, I'm talking about a manufactured type of inventory, so maybe like wine. How do you determine the value of the work in progress when the product is not quite finished? That's a bit complex. Or if we think about jewelry, the metal needs to be melted to a certain temperature and there could be a whole bunch of other processes that are required. So to determine where the value lies at a certain point while the finished good is not yet made could be very complex. So estimates are not cut and dry like your other balances and transactions where IFRA says this is when you record it and how you record it. And as a result, there's a high risk of material misstatements and so the auditing standards have said because of this we need to do extra work as auditors to make sure that the estimates are actually valued reasonably in the financial statements. Guys this standard goes into a lot of detail about what we as auditors need to understand when we do our risk assessment procedures but we've already addressed that. We know that as part of our risk assessment procedures, we need to go and identify the balances and transactions that have accounting policies, and then we've got to consider the risks associated with that. So we've already addressed that in our planning. We've got to then respond to those risks, and in responding, we've got to look at the controls to determine if we want to go and test controls, or if we're going to go about going a substantive approach. So the standard just recaps the planning around the estimate and then it goes into how we can get the evidence we need. It's not laid out as I've just done here in eight substantive procedures. It's quite spread out all over the standard. You'll see that when we work through it, but I've just gone and summarized what we need to do, what our thinking should be when it comes to an estimate in order to maximize marks. So, before you start jumping into auditing this estimate, you need to go and first find out what the accounting policy is. One mark, inquire with management as to the accounting policy used. Then, before we go and test that the accounting policy has been applied correctly, we need to make sure that accounting policy is reasonable and that it has been consistently applied. So in previous years, so to test reasonability, we go and compare their method or accounting policy to the industry norm. One mark, I simply state, test the reasonability by comparing it to the industry's accounting policy. And then to test that it's been consistently applied, I go and compare the accounting policy in the prior year financials to the current year. So now I know, okay, they haven't gone and changed the method. This accounting policy was used previously and I'm comfortable with what it was in the prior year. If, however, there was a change, then as auditors we need to go in, inspect that it has been authorised. The change in accounting policy was authorised. What are we going to look at the minutes of meetings, directors meetings, because they would have to approve a change in an accounting policy. Once we are now comfortable with the policy and the application, we have to go and test the calculation. 
but you are going to see when we look at the accuracy assertion, you cannot just recalculate something and be comfortable. You need to go and look at everything that was used in the calculation. So I say go and agree all the components of the calculation to supporting documentation. So if we're doing an estimate, what could it be for? For maybe depreciation or maybe allowance for credit losses or maybe it's useful life or maybe it's fair value adjustments. These are just some examples of estimates. So for depreciation, it's going to be the cost of the asset over the useful life of the asset. So you are going to have to agree the cost to an invoice, the useful life to their calculation and estimate and reasonability, and then you can go and do the recalculating. Recalculate. Once you have tested the components and compared them to valid supporting documentation, allowance for credit losses is going to be the debtor's amount aged into a specific category. So I'm going to go and say they've gone and taken this invoice and put it in the 60 days. So I'm going to go and trace that back to the invoice to make sure that it is sitting in the correct aging category. And then I can go and recalculate the allowance for credit losses. So whatever the calculation is made up of, I want to test those first, then I'll do the actual recalculating. Like we said previously, it could be complex. So if it's complex, I'm going to use an expert. We've done experts. So I'm going to state you use an expert, but then you might want to go and test the expert. Is the expert competent, capable, independent? We can consider if there's any information that comes from subsequent events to help us with the value of the estimate. So because your estimate is a projection, when the final result happens, which could be after the end, you can do the comparison to see if you need to adjust the estimate. Okay, so use post-reporting date events to assist with determining whether that estimate was calculated fairly. New to this now, guys, change in standard, is that an auditor can develop a point estimate range, so this is where the auditor is not comfortable with the client's policy or calculation that they go, I'd rather go and develop my own estimate and then go and compare it to theirs to be able to say, no, nah, it's not reasonable, or yes, okay, fine, theirs is reasonable, even though I'm not quite comfortable with the policy and how they go about calculating. Okay, and then something always to consider is whether the controls are effective. Because if the controls around the estimates are effective, it's going to influence the substantive procedures that need to be done. Okay, so guys, when you get to auditing an estimate, whatever that estimate is, you want to put down these eight steps at least to maximize your marks for an estimate. Let's go into ISA 540, the revised standard, so you can see this. We're looking at ISA 540, the revised standard. This is for audits beginning on or after the 15th of December 2019. So we need to be looking at this standard. Guys, same as always, we look at the scope, the objective, the requirements, and then like I said to you, they do planning first with regards to how we should handle estimates. So planning, what are our risk assessment procedures? gaining an understanding of how they go about developing estimates and what type of estimates they have, what balances require estimates. Then from that, you have to go and identify the risks of material misstatement because I now understand everything I need to about those estimates. And finally, as auditors responding to those risks of material misstatement. So all of this is in the planning stage 
and then the actioning of that response is your performing stage. So guys, I'm not going to go into the detail of what we need to do in order to understand what balances have estimates, how they go about um, considering the risks in that. That we've already addressed. So I just wanted to look at, in the performing of this, how do we respond to the risks because of the estimates? So ultimately, what are the order procedures we need to do to test the estimates? So in responding, we've got to develop further order procedures to address those risks of material misstatements. And it says how we can go about doing that. First of all, we could look at any events that occur up to the date of the auditor's report. So this is ultimately including everything for the year that's being audited and then post that year until the report is issued. Or testing how they've gone about making that estimate or actually developing our own point estimates, so our own estimates and then doing a comparison to what they've done in order to see if it makes sense. Okay, I've highlighted here 85 to 89 just to discuss how we would go about testing. Okay, what we're saying here is that if the estimate has a high degree of subjectivity and it requires significant judgment by management, then ultimately as auditors we want to do more substantive procedures. However, things that may influence us wanting to do test of controls is if they've got a large volume of transactions, if we believe the controls are going to work, if they monitor those controls, if they do them frequently, and also if substantive procedures alone cannot provide sufficient evidence, why? Because maybe they use IT and as a result, there is a lack of audit trail for us. Okay, and so we would want to go about testing controls. Also very important to note from a previous standard, if there's a significant risk and we want to rely on controls around that significant risk, we have to test them in the current period. We can't rely on evidence we've got in previous periods because it's a significant risk. Where our approach is going to be substantive, then it shall include test of details. And A90 gives us some examples so we can add those examples to the test we would perform for an estimate. Examples like examining contract recalculating and agreeing assumptions to supporting documentation. Other ways we can test was if there was evidence after the financial statement date but before the auditor's report, it can help us to gather evidence about an estimate. A91 to 93 will give us some procedures. And I've got an example here for you. So if they are selling complete inventory of a discontinued product after period end, then that can give me evidence about the estimates of the net realizable value at period end date. So information or a transaction taking place after year end can help me to get the estimates of what it should be recorded at year end. Testing how they make it, paragraph 94. And all this paragraph is telling us is why it would be appropriate to go about testing it if they have had similar estimates in prior period and we believe they were appropriate. It makes sense to go about testing it again this year. Or if the estimate is based on a large population of similar nature, individually not significant. Or if the financial reporting framework shows you how to do a so, then it's easy for us to just test whether they have complied or if it's based on routine processing of data. Then I want to go about testing it. I don't necessarily want to develop my own um, point estimates and then compare it to theirs. But if we choose to test, we must make sure we are comfortable with the application of the methods, significant assumptions, the data used, and how they selected their point estimates. So now we've already looked at things to test whether the method or assumptions or data is actually appropriate. 
it now goes and breaks that up into what you need to do. So, with regards to the method, we need to see is the method appropriate? How? Maybe by comparing it to the industry method. So there's your analytical procedures there. Are judgments biased? Recalculate, because it says look at the calculations. For your assumptions, are the assumptions appropriate? Once again, an analytical procedure comparing to the market. Is there any management bias there? Are they consistent so compare it to the prior year? Data, is it appropriate? Is it relevant and reliable? So now is when you'd need to go and test that data. What is the source of the data? Is it relevant for the assertion we're trying to get evidence from? Okay, and then management point estimate. Do they understand estimation uncertainty and have they addressed it by selecting an appropriate method? Then, if they don't, we need to request them to do additional work there. Okay, another way we could go about testing the estimates is to develop our own point estimates and I've just put here the process to follow. We could use management's model and then develop our own assumptions. We could use our own model or we could engage in an expert to help us with that estimate. If management use an expert, you have to evaluate their work and then you've got to use your standard ISA 500 to look at their competence, capabilities, objectivity and the nature of the work performed. If there's any indicators of management bias, we need to consider if it's fraudulent and other effects on the engagement. You guys can go and have a look there of examples of indications of management, management bias. And then ultimately we need to conclude, is the estimate reasonable? And we would say that there's a misstatement if there's a difference between the auditor's point estimates and management's estimates, so if we chose to go about it by developing our own estimates, if we use their, their estimates and we calc recalculate it and there's a difference, once again, there will be a misstatement. Okay, and that's all I want to work through. You guys can go and have a look at the two appendixes for a bit more assistance on the different types of inherent risks that could be faced in developing estimates. Super.